everybody. Welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Today on this um, warm day, June 7th, 2023, I've been reading some memes, which I believe are true on Facebook, that um, we're telling any of the new residents, this is not the heat we were talking about. <laughs> you may think it is. It's not yet. Florida's just preheating, isn't it, Dr. Lester? <laughs> Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, yes. we're, we're getting there. Um, joining me today is my regular partner in education, Dr. Bill Lester. He's going to um, pipe in near the end of this program to talk a little bit about the edible plants that you can plant in the summer. Not a big... Uh, gardening time in the summer, is it here, Dr. Lester? No, you, I don't know. You have quite a few different choices. You just have to plant the correct things because right. if you plant the incorrect things like you did up north during the heat of summer, things will not work out well. Right. So we're going to get to that. We're going to get into the uh, ornamentals and the uh, edible plants, uh, the ones who like it hot. Some like it hot. So um, I am Lily Browning. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here for Hernando County Utilities. Um, we're kind of transitioning to a new email here. You can still reach me at lilyb at hernandocounty.us, but we're trying to get people used to this um, email here. Yeah, it's longer, but you really only have to put it in once and then, you know, I'll be a regular on your email system. Hernando County, FFL, at hernandocounty.us. Dr. Lester has a much easier email and all the hard questions need to be emailed to him at wlester at ufl, the University of Florida, dot edu because they educate you isn't that right yeah that's a good way to look at it <laughs> yeah <laughs> these are the nine principles of florida friendly landscaping and with the plants here in florida that that like it in the heat we're going to be covering um number one right plant right place but also right time that that is you know one of the big things as well so let's just jump right in there a lot of people when they're new to florida we hear quite a bit we hear this uh line nothing grows in florida i'm sure dr lester has heard that i know his master gardeners have heard that nothing grows in florida well look around obviously things are growing in florida i think what the frustration that comes out of that statement is nothing that I am used to or, you know, not at the same times that I'm used to. So you're here now, you know, when in Rome, when in Florida, let's, you got to adjust to what grows when here. Some of the flowers and things you grew up north will grow here just at different times. Um, but what's going to make it through these the, this hot, hot times? Well, we're going to cover that. Here's some of the annuals that will grow quite nicely. In Florida, we have standard old begonias, you know, standard plant there. Um, Celosia are these um, rooster's comb type uh, flowers. They come in all different kinds of colors. And coleus. Coleus isn't even necessarily the same with begonia. They're probably more on the perennial side than annual side. It's just after three, four years, they might start getting leggy and you might want to, you know, think about replacing them. I always say about annuals that use them in moderation. Don't rely on them to be your whole landscape, because that would be horrendously expensive. But also, you know, just choose an area, maybe around a patio that you like to change out um, to suit the seasons and, you know, suit your mood as well. 
just choose a small area to highlight those annuals because you know the whole carbon footprint involved with annuals you don't want to make that your whole landscape but these are coleus comes back year after year after year here's some others um cassandra very nice beautiful flowery plant black eye susans are a native but there are more in the beginning of summer i don't think you see very many black eye natives um, black eye natives, black eye Susans, um, thriving, you know, into August. They're more of a, a late spring kind of early summer type of flower, but but you can try it. What I want to say about some of these wildflowers, like your black eye Susans, um, be careful if you get them from seed, be careful to get them uh, from a Florida source. Because black eye Susans grow all over the country, and you may think a black eye Susan is a black eye Susan. Not necessarily. The kind that grow in Michigan are a different ecotype than the kind that grow here. You're going to have much better success um, with the ones that were meant to grow in Florida. One of the places you can look if you go to floridawildflowers.org, and then through them, they have a cooperative where you can actually order seeds that were meant to grow here. Here's another old standard, impatience. Um, my mother had tons and tons and tons of impatience. She couldn't get them to grow in the ground in Masaryk Town, but I would. she had tons of pots of them. I would take cuttings from the same thing and get them to grow 10 miles north in, in Brooksville. The one thing about impatience is, especially in this heat, they're going to want some shade. You put them out in the bright sun, you know, you might as well just give up on them. They're going to want some shade. That They're a great plant to stick under those trees. But also in the heat of the afternoon, they are going to be very dramatic. They're going to be what I call, they're one of the diva plants. They're going to try to tell you that they're dying <laughs> and that they absolutely need you to water them right then. Don't listen to them. I've killed them by listening to them at that time in the afternoon. Tell these impatients, okay, all right, Diva, why don't you talk to me in the morning and go out that morning. If they have not perked up, then yes, you know, give them a good drink. But be real careful. They are very prone to heat stress. They're going to react to heat stress. But see if they um, pop back up and are happy again in the morning. If not, then you can go ahead and water them. Here's some more annuals. This flamingo plant. Um, it, it is pretty much a perennial here in Florida as well. It'll freeze back and come back. Um, the wishbone flower, Terenia, beautiful, beautiful flower. Angelonia, all kind of lovely um, annuals we can have here. Now let's go to our uh, shrimp plants. We have the golden shrimp plant, the regular shrimp colored <laughs> shrimp plant. These again, I would call them perennials. They, they seem to get stuck in the annual um, category but I've seen them year after year, you know, pop up. Um, these and the, the coleus and all these easily propagato, propagatable plants, the um, impatience, all that. They're what I call the grandma plants because they just remind me of, of what my mother had, what every grandma, you know, has because they like to share with each other and they do very well here in Florida. Caladium. One of our bulbs, um, we can't do a lot of bulbs here in Florida. We can do caladiums and they come in a multitude of different um, colors and color mixtures and varieties. You know, you can have a really good time there, sizes, different sizes of caladiums. Now some more annuals, zinnias. Zinnias do great here in Florida. 
and you can have like several seasons of them throughout our warm season. In fact, a lot of um, uh, like touristy farms that want you to come to the mazes or like sunflower farms and corn farms that, you know, we're doing these agro tourisms. What they are branching out to now is growing these cut flowers. There's one here in Hernando County that I noticed this past year, um, this past Mother's Day, really just a month or so ago. And I believe they still have rows and rows and rows of zinnias and other types of cut flowers where you can go and cut a nice bouquet for yourself. Also great, you know, to grow in your own yard too. Zinnias, I mean, they're not natives, but they are fantastic because of the uh, flat surface, the flat wide surface they provide for a lot of our pollinators. Oh, it's just a great flower to have around. Um, Portulaca, here we go. A primrose is the other name for that. It is, there's native varieties, um, there's non-native varieties. It's like um, a succulent type of plant. We have some of this, the native grows naturally in our lawns and we try to kill it <laughs> as a weed, but um, the pink, the yellow, all sorts of, but it, um, they make a nice spreading, you know, just an area where you want something to spread, that'll do very, very well. And uh, many different types of salvias. The native is this red, this scarlet salvia. Uh, salvias are fantastic and they're self-seeding. Many different types out there that you can get. And they're going to bring hummingbirds as well as other pollinators to your um, landscape. I have salvia in my yard and it just absolutely loves it. The more annuals are little uh, marigolds. They're, you know, classic, um, nice um, annual there. Melampodium, the nice um, bright yellow, happy uh, flower. This is, this likes to spread. This has a good time <laughs> spreading. I don't know if it's still in the Master Gardener Nursery, Dr. Lester, but I know years ago they did have some of this and um, give it some room to spread and it'll look very happy there. Also morning glories. There are native varieties of morning glories. Um, you fill up a trellis, look, it will look wonderful uh, in your yard. Here's another type, um, we're going to move to the perennials. Another type of, um, salvia here, this blue salvia. I know that the master gardeners, or at least they did have this available. It gets pretty tall, like three feet or so. It's even darker blue than this picture is um, showing. And I, I just love it. It's a, it's a great, you know, a great addition to your Florida yard. Here uh, we have our state wildflower, Coreopsis. It's also called tick seed. Will not attract ticks. That is not why it's called that. It's called that because the seeds look like ticks. Um, Coreopsis is a, another one of those wildflowers where you wanna make sure you get, um, well, the Leavenworth eye, I believe, is the Florida State flower. There's several different varieties that do grow in Florida. Just make sure you get a Florida ecotype. Daylilies is another bulb flower that we can grow um, here in Florida. Um, your daylilies and your amaryllis, we can grow from bulbs. Just be careful with those I wouldn't make an entire landscape of those because they are a favorite of our Southern lubber grasshopper. And I know, I think it was last year, Dr. Lester got a phone call from a gated community where somebody said the lubbers were destroying and eating their entire landscape. And I know many people believe that can happen, 
Dr. Lester and I, neither one of us have seen that occurrence. But if you don't have a good diversity, if you're, you know, very, all you want are daylilies and amaryllis and those type bulb plants, well, of course, then the uh, insects, which are attracted, I think I let someone in, okay, um, the insects, which are attracted to that type of plant, and, you know, they're going to show up, and there isn't another, you know, other types of plants around to kind of make up for the damage that was done. So that is, you know, one of the good reasons to have a large diversity of plants. So if one suffers, your entire yard doesn't look like it's been destroyed. Um, some per other perennials over here, Penta. Penta is easy to find. Um, in any big box store, just um, be careful when you're wanting to attract pollinators. You know, ask questions at the stores to ask if these plants have ever been um, exposed to any kind of pesticides or if they have, have a systemic pesticide built in them because it doesn't really make sense to want to attract the pollinators, you know, to poisonous plants. So do be careful where you purchase and find those things out. Bumblebees love pentas. Um, lots of other pollinators do as well. Now here we have our, um, well, before we talk about the blanket flower, we'll go over to the gazania. I just love how this beautiful flower looks. Make a great addition to your landscape. Now let's talk about gallardia, blanket flower. I love blanket flower. I've got uh, lots of it. So it's gorgeous. <laughs> what has happened recently? Well, there was actually, it wasn't as recent as we're thinking. It was a 10 year study um, to uh, kind of, people were suspicious whether or not this blanket flower as presented here, this Puchella was a native or was it just naturalized? And they came to the conclusion that it kind of inched over from Texas and just naturalized here. It's not an official Florida native because it was not here uh, when Europeans first made contact. That's kind of the, the line 15 whatever it was when Ponce de Leon came. This wasn't here then. So the poor thing has been kicked off of the native plant team. That's okay. I root for it anyway, and I would have it, you know, in any yard that I can. It's a fantastic, wonderful, Florida-friendly plant. Took me a little bit because I knew there was somewhere, there was a native blanket flower. And it, you know, if you go do a uh, internet search, what's going to happen is you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff calling this Gallardia Pagella native because for years we thought it was. So that is all that, you know, the information you're going to find. But as I said, new information now is it's, it's naturalized, not necessarily native. But I knew there was a native blanket flower out there. And I think at least this lance leaf blanket flower, Gallardia astivalis, is one of the natives. They're not as prolific as our wonderful friend Bruchella appears. So they're not as well known. There are native blanket flowers, but I think the problem if you're if you know more power to you if you want to go on a search to find the absolute pure native blanket flower. I think and we're going to talk about beach flower in a moment, beach sunflower. Probably there's been so much hybridizing between this naturalized and some of the other natives that it might be impossible to really be able to tell. It's a great flower. Have it, <laughs> have it in your yard. Here's some other perennials, shell ginger. Any of the gingers do fantastic really through our summer months. Um, this one just will give you the, these very pretty flowers. I like this peacock ginger as a ground cover. It's going to have to be in the shade. I think most of your gingers prefer shady areas. 
this peacock ginger to me um, is kind of a way that we in Florida can have pretend hosta. It's not going to be real big and tall and brushy, but it'll cover the ground nice. And um, this photo is not giving it justice as to the great colors in those leaves. So it's it's a great plant to have. More perennials, um, bulbine. You can have yellow bulbine. You can have orange bulbine. It's a succulent type plant. Fills up a bed very nicely. Canna lilies, um, red, yellow. Uh, this is one of the Florida favorites, one of the grandma plants because it's easy to share and, and propagate. Um, it's going to freeze here in Hernando County, but just clean it up, cut it back, you know, when spring starts again, and it'll start coming back. I haven't seen much of this blackberry lily, but it's fascinating and I really like it. And yes, sir. We carry that at the Master Gardener Nursery, and I think that's the only place where I've ever seen it. Ah, okay. And when it flowers in the summer, it's beautiful. Yeah, and it looks almost like um, some kind of succulent. Is that? Is it that looks, when it, for most of the year when it's growing, it looks similar to an iris. Okay. It's yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. So we will give you information of where the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery is near they the end. Still have some. Yes. Here's some more perennials. Um, uh, speaking of irises, that was a good segue. Here's your African iris. Beautiful plant, beautiful plant. What I have noticed about the African iris is they grow okay, you know, in the western part of the county near the coast in the sandier areas. But the more inland you go, um, more on that Brooksville Ridge inland that where they do have some clay, like where your nursery is, where downtown Brooksville is, probably Inverness, Dade City, they grow wonderfully. <laughs> they grow like zucchini up north. So whereas, you know, when your neighbors went to the store, you might throw a clump of African iris on their porch for them. <laughs> so they do, they cover an area quite well. I happen to really like the colors, you know, three different colors in one flower is really cool to begin with. But also, I think I've told you, Dr. Lester, purple and gold is Hernando High's uh, uh, colors. <laughs> so another reason I particularly like that plant. I never thought of that. <laughs> I thought of it immediately when I saw it. <laughs> Here we have beach sunflower. It is a fantastic native flower. Um, native ground cover, really. Um, I had it at my house in the front flower bed. Not, I mean, it covered the front flower bed for many years, and then it started kind of petering out there. It's still in different places in my yard, and I figured out what happened. Uh, the soil got too nice <laughs> in my front bed. This plant, look at its name, beach sunflower, dune sunflower is its other name. It wants the crummiest soil in your yard <laughs> to be able to grow. Um, and it'll grow happily there. It will freeze, but that's okay. You'll clean it up and it'll come, it'll come back. In fact, several times a summer, I, because it wants to inch to where it's hotter and more miserable, <laughs> so it inches towards the sidewalk, I, have to, I would have to cut it off the sidewalk to be able to walk into the house to trim it. Um, great plant. I highly recommend it. These little yellow flowers are about the size of a 50 cent piece and the plant will be covered in them most of the year till you have a freeze. And then until, you know, they start to come back, which is late April, May. Um, I, I bought them from the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery. I never had any success transplanting them in the ground. They are of a mind to do what they want to do. I had success for a season growing them in a pot. They don't like pots that much because once we have several months of a rainy season, 
these plants want it dry and hot and miserable. So if they're in a pot, they will the um, stems will start to get black and they'll kind of die out, you know, by fall. That's what happened. The following season, I had more beach sunflower, not in that pot, but beside that where that pot had been. So it is very much, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, but it attracts pollinators and it's a great plant to have. Dr. Lester and I have just recently become aware of, you know, uh, controversy, if you want to call it that, in the beach sunflower, in the dune sunflower world. And do you want to talk about that, Bill? Sure. They're all one species, but there's just different um, biotypes. One slightly different type of beach sunflower grows, is native to the east coast of Florida. Another one is native to the west coast of Florida, although it's more panhandled than like Fernando County, west coast of Florida. There's I, four or five different, slightly different types of dune sunflower native to Florida. I, and I, I thought we're it not was, sure yeah. exactly what we have at the nursery, but we do have a identification key now. So they're going to figure out which one they have at the nursery, but they um, interbreed a lot and you end up with a lot of unique hybrids. So right, they're, right, right. It's, it's a big genetic jumble. There is no um, hard and fast rule about you should plant this kind here and you should not plant this kind. Well, I think what I heard is that with the name East Coast, that's where we were confused. East Coast, West Coast, we thought people were being very picky there, but I think the name East Coast um, beach sunflower is not a native at all, even to the East Coast. That's what I understood. So therefore that's why they wanted to make sure people were buying the West Coast. But even the um, plant ID expert that you sent information to at the University of Florida, he said, it's probably too late to yeah, it's probably stop the interbreeding. But what most of you have growing in your yards is some type of hybrid. Right. Still a great flower. Have mm -hmm. it. It's fantastic. Yes. Purple cone flower, Euchanasia. Um, that's another one of our natives. So, you know, take a chance on the purple cone flower. Make sure you get a Florida ecotype. One of my favorites here, this purple passion vine. This flower that looks like Dr. Seuss grew it. It's just, or drew it, I mean. It is a fantastic uh, flower to have around. If you're lucky, lucky, you might even get some fruit from it. Two different butterflies uh, call this um home. It's a host plant for the Gulf Fritillary and the Zebra Longwing. And the Zebra Longwing is our state butterfly. Be careful with your passion vines. This is where you do need to make a distinction. This purple one that I'm showing you is a native. There's a native called a corky screw passion vine that isn't as ostentatious <laughs> as this flower, but it's a cute little vine and um, large butterfly attractor, you know. And, but just don't get the twin passion flower that are like red and yellow. Those are an invasive non-native. So that's, these are, that's the times you wanna be careful. Coral honeysuckle, this is what I have at the bottom here. Um, it's a native like all up the East Coast, maybe even further. It is like, you know, not just Florida's native honeysuckle. I've noticed it's native, at least up through Virginia, maybe further. Um, it's so much prettier than the Japanese honeysuckle. We don't have an issue here. The Japanese honeysuckle doesn't grow that well in Florida. But if you've come from up north, you know it takes over everything and it's an invasive plant up there as much as we may have enjoyed it as children as much as we may have um you know memories about the wonderful aroma of the japanese honeysuckle and you know we pull out the stamen and like, eat the honey from you know as much as we might have those wonderful memories 
Japanese honeysuckle is a, is a invasive plant up north. Why not replace it with this coral honeysuckle? Um, this this particular one belonged to a master gardener who's no longer with us, but those big, you know, red tubular flowers are going to get hummingbirds every time. So it's it's a great, and you can find that at a lot of native plant nurseries. This ground cover, sunshine mimosa. I'm not talking about a happy drink. It's it's a happy ground cover. Um, um, this particular picture is of another uh, former master gardener that Bill and I know that they use this for a lawn. That is her lawn. This sensitive plant, it's in the sensitive plant family. So if you touch it, you know, the leaves will kind of close up and it closes up in the evenings. But it has these wonderful pink puff balls. There's also mixed feelings. <laughs> about the sunshine mimosa. I know that uh, Bill's master gardeners at the nursery, we don't say this word sunshine mimosa to them because they have had experiences where previous gardeners had planted it and it became very aggressive. So if you're trying to tame it into one flower bed, give up trying to plant much of anything else in that fire you know flower bed it is it depends on what you're looking for and it also depends on situations because i have tried to grow it at my house and it barely wants to stay you know alive <laughs> it's still hanging on um we'll see what happens in 5 years you know but so just get a few, maybe, and see how they spread. And it depends on the situation that you're looking for. This dotted horse mint, also known as spotted bee balm. Again, the picture doesn't do it justice because there are all these wonderful dots on these bracts here. This looks like pretty much a bunch of nothing weeds until these flowers come up. Um, do you have any of this at the Master Gardener Nursery, Bill? I'm not sure if they have it for sale or not, but we do have one growing at our office right up against the building. And by the summer, it gets waist high, lots of flowers. Bees absolutely love it. The, especially bumblebees absolutely go crazy for it. And um, it was growing naturally in my former neighborhood. And, you know, I hate to see all the lots being cleared. I tried to save some of it um, to have more bee balm, you know, around. So, and this, I love this. This, we do have a native hibiscus. You know, plenty of the others, hibiscus, hibisci, <laughs> will grow in our heat. And those are fine plants too. They're, you know, nothing wrong with them. They're Florida friendly. But look at our cute little native scarlet hibiscus. This needs um, a wet area. It grows in a swamp, you know, naturally, but it needs, if you have kind of a wet area, this wonderful scarlet hibiscus would be the way to go. Persian shield, usually you see that in a pot, um, so you can bring it in um, when it's going to get cool. Beautiful dark purple, dark green leaves. Ornamental sweet potatoes, the various different colors. Again, if you want something that spreads and you have a lot of room to allow it to spread, this, um, you know, is a great thing to do the job. It will freeze, so it's not going to be around all the time. Ornamental peppers. Don't try to eat these. Apparently, they are way off the, the what, SCOBY scale? Is that the name of it? You know, with, you know what you can ingest you none of them are dangerous that i know of uh the problem is that they're really really hot right right yes i love these these ornamental peppers would make a great addition to you know throw into any uh yard i always tell bill that i want these to be a cool season annual but they don't listen to me <laughs> <laughs> they are a warm season annual. You're not going to get them to grow that well in the cool season. I just think they look like Christmas lights and would be 
a fantastic cool season uh, plant, but we can enjoy them in the hot season as well, since that's when they want to be here. Here are uh, different milkweeds. There's many different milkweeds that you can um, experiment with. If you're going to try to have native milkweeds, which we highly encourage, um, these are the three that have been successful so far to um, be marketable. Um, we have 21 native milkweed in the state, only three so far, but they're working on others. We might've stretched that out to like five or so have been able to be, you know, successful to propagate and then make it to sale and then do well in a yard where you put it instead of just having a mind of their own to grow wherever they feel like growing, which is fine, but unfortunately a lot of that land might be being developed. So it's a good idea then to bring it into our own yards. This middle one is, this orange one is the Sclapia tuberosa. If you are in a dry sandy location, like probably most of you are, and you are in the market for a native milkweed, look for this Asclepius tuberosa, this orange milkweed. The one on the side here, Incarnata, and this white one, Perennis. I, I get their names mixed up, but I know this is Incarnata. I want it to be Perennis because it's pink, but it again, it won't listen to me. This is Incarnata. This is Asclepius. Perennis. These are both commonly called swamp milkweeds. So what does that tell you? It's going to need a wet area. Um, having native milkweed is far preferable to the tropical milkweed that you can purchase, you know, easily in any store. First of all, make sure that they were not treated with any kind of systemic pesticide. That's number one. Secondly, if you do have the tropical milkweed, um, we just ask that you cut it back in November. It might keep trying to grow if, if we're warm. So keep cutting it back till at least mid-April. And the reason for that is, you know we have sudden cold fronts. These native milkweeds naturally go down um, during the cool season responding to daylight hours. Why does that matter? Because we don't want to artificially keep the monarchs around when they should be going further south. If you're listening from South Florida, great, you know, keep all that <laughs> all year. If you're listening from Central Florida on up, don't encourage these monarchs to hang around during our cool months because we could have a sudden cold snap and they're not going to live through it. So those those tropical milkweeds don't know to you know, go down naturally. So just don't provide that food for them so that they can move on to warmer places. Some of our uh, milkweed goes to South Florida, stays there, they have a population there. Some of them are gonna go you know, on their journey to Mexico. We need to encourage that. So these are just three of the natives that um, are you know that you can find at native plant nurseries they are working on having more as well we see these all over the place <laughs> these um i once had a family member visiting here and it took me several seconds because she kept asking me what are the flower trees what are the flower trees <laughs> and it finally dawned on me oh you're talking about great myrtles um these grow you know very easily <laughs> here in Florida. There's many different types of varieties. These are probably the three most common. This old um, Natchez is the white one. I don't remember the names of the, <laughs> these hybridized ones. They have other ones out now that have uh, called black diamond that have leaves that are so dark, they almost look black. And then they'll have pink or even yellow flowers against them that really pop. The thing with crepe myrtles is if you want a small tree, 
get a dwarf variety and overestimate what they say it's going to grow to. If you get a 15 foot tree, tell yourself 20. Don't get one of these old fashioned Natchez's and try to keep it to be a 15 foot tree. It's not going to be a healthy tree if you don't let it, you know, grow to its full potential. That's the quick and easy way of going through that. Here's our Southern Magnolia. Uh, they're blooming right now. I've seen lots of magnolia blooms out there. Um, they're kind of humorous to me because many native Floridians that I know are not fans of the magnolia tree, not because they dislike the magnolia tree, but because they had to rake the leaves when they were children. <laughs> um, there are other varieties, um, um, more hybridized ones called Little Gem and uh, Saucer Magnolias that are more on a level where you can see and enjoy the flowers and pick them more. Um, but, you know, these Southern Magnolias are great if you have a lot of room to have them. Here's a plant um, that I think was at the beginning of the 2000s, it was pretty popular, at least among the master gardeners here in Hernando County. Um, but then it went, you know, didn't hear much more about it anymore. But it's coming back again in popularity called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. So why is it called that? It it's, makes it's a great shrub in your yard. Why is it called that? Because when the flowers come out and they cover this bush, when the flowers come out, they're going to be this dark, dark purple. Day two, they're gonna be lighter lilac-y color. Day three, they're gonna to fade to white and then they're gonna fall off. And of course they don't all do that at the same time. So you have many different colors on this bush. I think it's a great plant to have around. Here's another native, oak leaf hydrangea. It likes the shade. It's going to give you these wonderful hydrangea flowers. They're going to be white. Um, and I just love the leaves, even when it's not flowering. It's a great bush to have around. This one is easily found in big box stores, loripedlum or Chinese fringe bush. I actually happen to like them better when they're not flowering. I don't mind the pink <laughs> fringy flowers, but I love the dark purple. The variety that is usually available is called Plum Delight, and that has this dark, this dark purple foliage. Here's a pretty popular one, especially on the East Coast. Must it must tolerate be very salt tolerant because I see a lot of oleander on the East Coast. And Dr. Lester and I talk about this all the time. It's a great, beautiful flower. But if there is a, a plant that has an insect named after it, count on having a problem <laughs> with that insect, <laughs> with that plant. Here's our friend here. Its name is Oleander caterpillar. So if you have a caterpillar and it's suddenly all eaten, you might be like, what is going on? Well, this oleander caterpillar is going to turn into this beautiful moth. It is a moth, believe it or not. It's called a polka dot wasp moth. It does not sting, is not a wasp. It's just kind of shaped like one. Um, you know, very nice moth actually, but this is real damage that I've seen it do to a ole an oleander. An adult oleander is going to withstand this, but we don't want that to be the, um, you know, the only, you know, tree in our front yard, you know, that, you know, invites people. So you have several choices here. I mean, I guess you can treat for them, but then you might be um, endangering your other pollinators. You can not have an oleander, <laughs> then you won't have the problem. Or you can just tolerate this and just stick it in the back somewhere, let it get eaten up, and then, you know, come back. You know, th those are your choices with the oleander. This firecracker plant, a lot of people seem to think this is a native. It's not, but it's a very easy to care for, uh, low maintenance, 
you know, would cover an area that maybe you would have put shrubs or something before, but great. And what are we gonna get with our red tubular flowers? Right, we're gonna get hummingbirds. All righty, it is time for Dr. Lester to take over and talk to us uh, about practical matters now that we have oud and odd on all the beautiful flowers because they're practical too because we need the pollinators to um, help grow these uh, edible plants. So you can take over, Dr. Lester. Okay, great. Um, there are a number of different edible plants that we can grow during the summer, but a word of warning, if you've just recently moved to Florida from another state, if you try growing a vegetable garden or an herb garden or whatever it might be here, and you're planting things the same time that you did in Michigan or Pennsylvania or any other state much further north than Florida, the timing is gonna be very, very different. What you grew during the summer, your tomatoes and green peppers and cucumbers and green beans, let's say in Pennsylvania during the summer, June, July, and August, we grow totally different things here at that time of year. Those crops grow very well here, but you have to grow them either early in the spring or later in the fall because they don't like it too hot. <laughs> and it's about to get really hot here. So next slide. So you can, even if you live in a deed restricted community, if you have a homeowners association, and they don't appreciate you digging up the front yard and putting in a great big vegetable garden. Uh, we don't wanna see anybody get in trouble or have problems with their HOA over that. You can still tuck and hide a lot of edible plants in your yard. You can grow them in decorative containers. So there are different vegetables that grow at different times of the year. Things that grow better during the winter, during the cool season, the lettuces, the kales, they can all be grown in a large decorative container very easily. Uh, Lily mentioned the um, ornamental peppers. You can grow real hot peppers here. They grow great, all the different varieties, hot, super hot, everything in between. You're gonna grow them in the spring and fall and you can grow them in a container. They look pretty. Eggplants are an attractive plant. They flower, they get attractive eggplants on them. So why not try growing them in a container or kind of tucking them in your ornamental plant beds? And if you do it right, your neighbors won't notice and you won't get a nasty letter from the HOA, which is always a good thing. Next slide. So University of Florida does have a lot of guidance on what you should be growing here in Florida. Uh, every month of the year, if you go online, you can find this. Um, under University of Florida planting calendars, I believe it's available online. If you just follow our Facebook page, our short name on Facebook is Hernando EXT, short for Hernando Extension. Um, our uh, office assistant, Teresa, is diligent about putting these up the first of the month. So here you see an infographic for things that you can plant in June. And this is broken up by North Florida, Central Florida, and South Florida. So wherever you live, the rules are slightly different. Here in Hernando County, we're in Central Florida. So you can see the different things that you can plant and grow right now. And none of them are really tomatoes or green peppers or green beans. They're all tropical crops, things that you might not be very familiar with. Um, okra. Uh, black eyed peas, southern peas, uh, sweet potatoes, things like that. I just did a class on different uh, vegetable crops that you can grow in your vegetable garden during the heat of summer. I'm sure we're going to show the link to Hernando County's YouTube page at the very end. And if you go there, by a little bit later on today, the video recording of that class is supposed to be up there so you can watch that for more details. Next slide, please. Now you see in July, it's kind of much the same. Things like boniato, which is a uh, tropical sweet potato, different edible gingers, roselle. You can grow sugar cane here. It grows great during the summer. Uh, you can cut the sugar cane up in the fall. Kids like to chew on it. That's kind of the old fashioned way of enjoying 
raw sugarcane. Uh, cassava, calabasa is also Cuban pumpkin, chayote, okra, southern peas. There's things that you can grow here, but none of these are the, the typical vegetables that you're probably familiar with growing in more northern states. Next slide. So we can grow a number of different herbs here during the summer. All of the different Mediterranean herbs. So think pizza, think Italian food, think Greek food, all the different herbs that you're going to add to that, the basil, the oregano, things like that. They grow very, very well here, but they do the best in the spring and in the fall. Winter, if we start getting bad freezes, they can freeze and die from that. Summer tends to be a little stressful uh, on things like uh, basil, and I think the next slide we're going to talk about oregano also, because it's just a little bit too hot and steamy here for it. They'll kind of recover and perk back up in the fall, or you can replant, you can plant a crop of them in the spring and another crop in the fall. We do have a couple of herbs that do really well here during the summer. Two I can think of off the top of my head is lemongrass which maybe you've used in uh, Asian cuisine. You can make a tea out of it. It loves the heat, humidity. When it gets really hot and rainy, lemongrass grows like a huge weed. And it's very attractive and very ornamental also. Easily worked into your front flower beds as an ornamental grass. Just don't tell your neighbors that it's something that you can eat because then they might complain to the HOA about you. And also Cuban oregano, which isn't a true oregano like you see in the picture on the left here that looks like oregano. This has a larger leaf and it's kind of um, greenish and yellowish color. It tastes just like oregano and it grows fantastic during the heat of summer. It will fill a hanging basket or a pot and spill over. You can dry it to save it and preserve it to be used in uh, all your Cuban dishes and other South American cuisine throughout the year, it will freeze during the winter. You have to bring it in when it gets really, really cold. But I did that this past year and mine is all set. And now that it's starting to heat up and we got a few rains, it's really starting to take off in my backyard. So there are different herbs that you can grow. Traditional ones, uh, marjoram, oregano, summer savory, you can grow them. They're gonna suffer a little bit during the high heat of summer when it gets really humid all day and all night, but you can still grow them and enjoy them. Next slide. So most important, you need, if you're new to Florida, you need to be careful when it gets really, really hot out there. Try to work either very early in the morning or in the evening when things are a little bit cooler, it hasn't gotten hot yet. I tell you what, working in the evening sometimes, especially if you have a little bit of a breeze going, when the sun's just going down, it's absolutely beautiful out there. Good time of day to be out in the garden. Wear mosquito repellent all day long because we have a lot of mosquitoes here that are out in the middle of the day, and they tend to be the nasty ones that help to transmit diseases. Drink lots and lots and lots of water. I know that research shows the older you get, the more prone you might be to dehydration. So if the older you get, the more water you need to drink, not the less water. Try to follow the shade in your yard so don't be out there in the middle of the day, in the middle of your front yard in absolutely no shade. Go out there and say, oh, it's shady over in that corner. I'll work over there. As the sun moves, kind of try to follow the shade. Wear loose, light-colored clothing. Take frequent breaks. I'll be outside in the garden for a while, then I just pop in the house for five minutes, grab some water. Cool off a little bit, drop by a couple degrees, and then head back out and do a bit more. Uh, wear, use sunscreen, wear a hat. Just be very, very careful because if you kind of are out there in the yard, in the garden, you're having fun, you're enjoying it, the heat can sneak up on you. And all of a sudden, you don't feel really well. So we don't want anybody to, to make themselves ill or injure themselves when working outside. Next slide. And I'll let Lily take over with all our upcoming classes and other links here. Okay, thank you, Bill. Yes, we have classes coming up. Um, we're having this class again in person. Well, I'm having this class again. Bill will not be joining me at the library. 
But um, next Wednesday, Spring Hill Branch Library on Spring Hill Drive. So if you know someone that you think would enjoy this class, but they don't want to watch it online, um, it will be available this afternoon on Facebook and then eventually on uh, our Hernando County Government YouTube, probably in a couple of days. But if they don't want to do it, you know, online or look at a computer at all, I'll do it in person next um, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. at the Spring Hill Branch Library. So if you just want to hear it again in person or know somebody that you know, would like to send, we don't need registration. The library classes haven't picked up that much since in this post-COVID era. You know, we haven't got a lot of people coming back. So just just come by and have a seat and we'll have a nice time. Bill and I will meet again just like this uh, in this format on June 21st at 10 a.m. for some important information. Um, Hernando County, the Board of County Commissioners passed a revised, um, they passed revisions to our Hernando County Fertilizer Ordinance. And there are some pretty important changes to that. So we're gonna get all that information together, not only just let you the new rules know the new rules bill will guide you in how to handle your lawn specifically within you know the matrix of these new rules isn't that right dr lester yes very important information for hernando county residents so keep in mind it will apply to hernando county other counties have their own fertilizer rules so go ahead and if you live in somewhere outside of hernando county check with your county extension to find out what kind of rules you have for fertilizing. But also it'd be well worth listening to because you are going to discuss, you know, specifically for that summertime ban um, that we have right now, um, what you can do with your lawn to help it, you know, thrive. Yes. With, we'll without nitrogen. On, on ways to have a good looking lawn without having to fertilize the heck out of it. Right. Okay, and then July 5th at 10 a.m., um, we'll have a virtual class, Pledge to Go Florida Friendly. So we're going to go over all the nine principles again and how you can take the pledge, li literally the um, Florida Friendly Landscaping main office at the University of Florida has developed this, this pledge that you can take. You just go online and you, you know, pledge to do these things within all the nine principles, but I'm, we're, I'm just going to guide you, you know, with, if we all did a little, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. And if we all just take the pledge, so much better for the environment. Within those time frames, I also, June is going to be rain barrel palooza. I have three workshops in June. One is tomorrow evening. Um, it's a virtual one. Pickup of the barrels will be next Saturday, June 10th at the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery from eight until 10 because Lily <laughs> does not like to be out after 10 o'clock in the heat of the summer. <laughs> um, and then two in-person ones coming up June 13th, June 28th here at Hernando County Utilities. How do you participate? You do have to be a Hernando County resident. The rain barrels are $65. That's our bulk price. I just saw them, you know, because of the targeted advertising that happens on Facebook. These exact rain barrels I saw in a advertisement for a very popular big box store. They were $159, <laughs> Dr. Lester. So you can get them for 65 here at Hernando County Utilities if you are a Hernando County resident. If you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities that you get your water from us, for your first barrel and attending a class, you will receive a $30 credit on your water bill. Can't beat that deal. Sounds <laughs> like a bargain. Yeah, rainy season is starting. So, you know, come join us. How you sign up and how you find out more information is to email me. Down here, we have the uh, email, Hernando County FFL 
at hernandocounty.us or email Lily B, L I L L Y B, at hernandocounty.us. Either one is going to get to me, and we will work on getting you registered for these rain barrels and classes. There are many ways to stay informed. This is the address and phone number of where Dr. Lester, um, where his office is, and mostly where Teresa is, and she is a big <laughs> help there. And on Thursdays is Master Gardener Bernie, and he is a huge help. Call between eight and three on Thursdays, maybe 8.30 and three, and talk to Bernie. He loves to, you know, spend a lot of time helping you figure out your, your yard issues. Down here is where Dr. Lester commented on Hernando County government's YouTube. So just the easiest thing to do is go to YouTube and then do a search for Hernando County government, not just Hernando County, Hernando County government. You will find our playlists. Dr. Lester's would say Hernando extension. He has about a dozen or so um you know things for you to watch there i'm working on i don't know 113 or something like that this class will be on there um you know every class that we do you can find then recorded on hernando county government youtube so as i tell everyone you know with my 100 over 100 of them if you have any trouble sleeping that's a great place to go so <laughs> Here's our emails again. Um, if you would like to contact us, Hernando County FFL at hernandocounty.us or wlester at ufl.edu. We're going to address the chat after we turn off the recording, but I would like to thank Dr. Lester for joining me today in our Some Like It Hot presentation. If you have any questions about growing edible food in these winter months best thing to do is to email dr lester down here and, and pictures he likes pictures he likes lots of pictures yeah, pictures help but if you send him your tomatoes that are having all sorts of problems right now he's going to tell you yep <laughs> it's the time of year for tomatoes to be having problems they're going to be wrapping up with your tomato harvest but they're not going to last you know, through July and August. Everything that can be wrong with the tomato will be wrong with the tomato in our heat. Start those up again around Labor Day, probably. But he can give you all of that wonderful information. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, we will see you in two weeks, unless you come to the library to see me next week. But everyone have a wonderful Florida-friendly week. Thank you.